Good afternoon. I'm Patty Jimenez, teacher librarian and a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit questions via the chat at the bottom of your screen. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Pam Rogers will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple four question evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. The Arizona Library Association wishes to acknowledge the native nations that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations on whose ancestral homelands and resources AZLA members, member libraries were built. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Arizona Library Association members accountable to the information needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. Please support AZLA. When you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. The AZLA professional development webinars reach librarians and library professionals in Arizona and throughout the USA. Do you know a business or organization that would benefit from direct access to library professionals? Contact us at development at azla.org for sponsorship levels and rates. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On April 14th, join us for Don't Be a Chill Host. This meeting won't be terrible and neither should yours with Bridget Whip and Chris Holt. Migrating to Zoomland, USA has amplified a problem we have all experienced, the agonizing meeting. Maybe you're in your fourth back-to-back -back meeting of the day without a break, one person takes the whole thing off course, nothing gets accomplished, or the dreaded, this should have been an email. And that's how we all end up in a room full of folks with cameras off so they can hide their uncontrollable eye rolls and face palms an option that won't be available when if we ever meet in person again. In this interactive session, participants will learn how to become better facilitators in order to host more productive, meaningful, and useful gatherings. This meeting about meetings will discuss what makes in-person, virtual, and hybrid meetings go poorly and how to address those problems in advance and in the moment. Participants will walk away with tools for intentional preparation, tips for encouraging discussion from silent voices, and advice for useful follow-ups. Meetings may never be a blast, but they definitely don't need to be terrible. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar, the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, 
and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank all of you for attending today. Please welcome Mandy Carrico, Sky Larson, and Becky Gallivan Butler for their presentation, Using Open Plus Technology and Collaboration to Service Library Patrons. Thank you, Patricia. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this session. We're from Scottsdale Public Library, and we are here to talk about a technology product called Open Plus by Biblioteca that we use to provide building access to our patrons without any staff present. So given the time frame that we have, we are gonna keep it to a high level so that we can touch on several aspects of this. And these are going to include how the service came about, the collaborations that we used to bring it forward, what we had to do operationally to implement this, our patrons' response to the service, and then also we're going to talk about how we plan on evolving it. We're going to reserve questions until the end to make sure we can get through all the slides. We have about 15 minutes for questions, and there we can deep dive more specifically with our answers and focus on the areas of this presentation that interested you. So with that, let's introduce everyone to the panel. My name is Mandy Carrico. I'm the Senior Manager over Operations and Public Services. Joining me today to present are two colleagues who were also integral to the implementation of this service, and I'll turn it over to each of them for their introductions. Thank you, Mandy. My name is Sky Larson, and I'm the Branch Manager at the Appaloosa Library. And this is Becky Gallivan Butler. I'm the Senior Manager of Support Services. And then finally, we also have on standby some of the wizards behind the technology setup. They will be available during the question portion of this presentation to answer technology specific questions. We have Lee Schnorr. He is our systems integration supervisor and he was instrumental in the acquisition of Open Plus. We also have Joel Martinez Goodnetter, our senior systems integrator who facilitated the physical setup of the product. And he's also who we go to for ongoing support. And then we also have Dan Haskell, he's our Polaris expert, and he helped integrate the service with our ILS system. So I am going to take a few moments to familiarize everyone with this product in case someone on the call has not yet heard of Open Plus. So Open Plus is a bibliotheca product that allows libraries to provide unstaffed access to a library building. It's a program door that unlocks with the swipe of a patron's participating library card. Patrons scan the card, punch in their PIN number, and then they enter the building. There are several features a library can use with this product, and it can be customized to fit your needs. They have cameras, people counters, and statistics. The door mechanism is the main piece of the product, but you can add these extras on um, and that helps track how many people have entered the building. It will trigger the system to cease allowing entry if the number drops uh, or if the number until it'll, it will trigger a lock and that lock will be in place until the number drops below whatever you predetermine your limit to be for capacity. Scottsdale Public Library decided to use the door mechanism only we actually provided our own internal cameras and we decided not to employ any kind of patron capacity limit. The service is used by many libraries to expand existing hours. Or in our case, we used it to open the building under extreme limited budget circumstances and I'll explain more about that on the next slide. So how did it arrive in our library system? We originally explored this technology to transition our shared use library to an express services location for the community. We previously had a shared use branch that was located in a high school, and that's the Palomina branch that you see pictured here. After over 20 years of operating this location, it was decided to end our agreement with the school district 
and transition that space back into a school library because we found the majority of the building users were actually high schoolers. But studying our patron use, we saw that the non-students that came into the building came for mainly two reasons, to pick up their holds or to grab items from the new and most wanted shelves. We wanted to preserve this community use in a more accessible setting. And we decided to open an express library not far from the high school using open plus technology. However, the pandemic hit and all of our priorities changed. Our city government actually froze hiring and we were unable to open our northernmost branch, which is the Appaloosa Branch Library. We only had enough staff to keep the drive through running. We actually decided to switch gears and use Open Plus as a stopgap for the interruption in the building access. Many library systems that we spoke to during our research phase use the service to expand library hours. We didn't come across any that actually supplanted the library service completely. And that's how we, oh, oops. My apologies. Anyway, so that is how we intended to use it. And I just wanna note that um, I'm happy to say, as of mid-January, Appaloosa has reopened to its full operating hours. And with that, we've suspended using Open Plus because we are preparing it for its next purpose in our library services. In order to start the service, we had to involve several city departments. I think anytime anyone says, hey, we're gonna let the public into our government building without any staff, everyone cool with that? You're gonna get at least one person who is so not cool with that. And it takes some education, it takes some partnership to overcome that. So we started with our municipal security department. We went the heaviest on educating them. We invited them to the meetings with library systems that had already implemented the service with success. And hearing about those libraries and what they involved in their actual operations and answering the questions on safety and item retention went a long way with that department. And the benefit, our municipal security department became our advocates and helped soothe the worries of the other stakeholders that you see listed here. So we also needed buy-in, of course, from city management and that's where we went to next. With municipal security behind us, it was such an easier sell. But I'll also add that city management had been getting pressure from the public regarding our closed library buildings. So we do know that that helped our case in propelling this service forward. We also involved our legal team because patrons had to sign agreements to use the service. Our facilities department was also key because the building needed to um, have some prep in order for the service to run. And our IT department, and three of them I introduced to you at the beginning of this, were the most important of our partnerships because without them, we actually cannot even have an Open Plus service. So that is our service. We named it Pony Express at Appaloosa. And a quick side note about our library system, all of our branches, except for our main Civic Center Library branch, are named after horses. So we have the Mustang branch, the Arabian branch, the Appaloosa branch, and then we also have Pegasus, our virtual library. So we really wanted to choose a name that fit that same kind of theme. I also wanna note that we were very deliberate about using the term express. Every single advertisement, all descriptions of the service, and any referral to the service was always described as express or abbreviated. Not only did we want to avoid false expectations from our patrons, we really needed the messaging to remain consistent that this is not a full service library and does not replace the resources and services a full service library can provide. And we actually began that messaging at the time that we were getting stakeholder buy-in so that we weren't fighting to restore these services on the other side when it was time to open this building fully. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about what the Pony Express at Appaloosa service looked like. We operated six days a week for four hours a day. It was Monday through Saturday, and we switched between morning and afternoon so that we could reach as many users' schedules as possible. And we chose to have these limited hours so the staff running the drive-through could go onto the floor to shelve, to pull books, to fix displays, restock shelves of the self-service materials, and also complete other tasks 
without going onto the floor when patrons were present. We didn't want to create the I can't assist you right now kind of customer service experience. We kept our eligible patrons to our own county, the Maricopa County residents. And because the signed agreements were necessary, we kept enrollment to 18 and older, and we allowed minors to come in with adult supervision. As I said before, we did not have capacity limits or monitoring. With the absence of programs and Appaloosa's historical use, we didn't have any concerns that it was going to get too crowded to practice social distancing. Our study rooms and our quiet rooms were limited access. We basically decided to limit the spaces and services that typically, re typically require staff intervention. We did make one of our study rooms available like as a first come first serve kind of model. We closed our book resale shop. And the patrons were able to browse, they were able to use self checkouts, they were able to use study tables, library computers, Wi Fi, they could print, copy, and scan, they could use the library catalogs, and they could place the items on hold. Our ILS is Polaris, and this technology is compatible with Polaris. But we did need to make some modifications to get this service up and running. We had to switch out our sliding front door. Our previous door had pins on the bottom to secure it. Without the pins, anyone could just walk up and pry the door open. So we changed out our door to have a mag lock instead. We had a button on the inside that could disable that mag lock for emergencies. We added four of our own security cameras. Although, as I mentioned, Biblioteca provides them with their product if you wanted to choose that route. With those cameras, we can scroll back through footage and we can match up building entries or item checkouts with timestamps if there was ever an issue we needed to review. Also, a little bonus that we could put a feed in the back workroom so staff working the drive through could also see what was happening live if they needed to. And we didn't add RFD, we already had RFD in our system, um, but we're mentioning it here because it was important that RFD was present in the way that we chose to implement the service. We were able to track out any items that were not checked out using RFID. So why did we choose Appaloosa? And there were several reasons. We actually had two branches closed as a result of the hiring freeze and we decided to go with Appaloosa. It proved to be the better fit for a pilot. For starters, it's the northernmost branch and it's the furthest away from an open building. We wanted those most affected by distance to have an in-branch library option. It has a patron base that has the lowest number of incidents. It's also the most gently used of all of our branches. And by gently, I mean that repairs and replacements due to the public use are lower there than our other branches. There's a larger control on patrons from outside the immediate communities because it's such a far north location and there are less transit opportunities. In essence, we knew who was coming to the building. It has a very large senior population, and that also has its own pros and cons for this type of service. Some of the pros, it helps seniors who are more susceptible to immobility. It also helps seniors who need browsing access and those who are less likely to click through browsing on computers in order to place holds. But the cons is that we do know that this population can trend towards needing library staff assistance. I am now gonna pass it over to Sky, who will delve into the operational details of the service. Thank you, Mandy. So at the beginning of the project, we created an operation team to plan all the details involved with launching the service. We were mindful of the registration rules as we wanted to serve the community, but we were aware of the stewardship of our building and the, the city assets. So first, the registrants have to reside in Maricopa County. They had to reside in Maricopa County because as Mandy said, we wanted to serve our base patrons. 
we decided not to open it to out of county residents because again, we hadn't decided to monitor the uh, attendance and we felt like this would better um, keep us with a manageable amount of people in the building. Next, we required everybody to be 18 years and older. This was, being, was done because we were aiming to avoid parents dropping children off and the potential issues that that might raise. Their library cards had to be in good standing or had to be made to be in good standing before they could register. It was important for them to be current as we were working to have their library information accurate. And just a moment. We required them that they must register in person. By registering them on site, there were several things that needed to happen. We wanted to take their photos so that we would be able to recognize any patrons who violated the user agreement. They needed to provide a photo ID. By doing this, that was keeping us consistent with our library registration process. And we continued to use this with this Pony Express registration. Patrons must sign a user agreement. They were required to sign the user agreement because we wanted them to all agree to the rules and to hear the same message as they were registering. If patrons did bring their signed agreement in from home where they had printed it and, and signed it at home, we um, would work with that, but we also had them on hand for them to sign, read and sign when they were there at the window. We also had them sign a mask agreement. We did have a mask and safety agreement at the start of the service because we had a local mask mandate. When the mask mandate was lifted, we did eliminate that um, agreement, but we continued to encourage the use of masks, not requiring it. And lastly, staff highlighted significant points of the user agreement and answered questions that the patrons had. We created a scripted overview as we wanted to be able to review the service offerings, as well as highlight the most important components of the user agreement. This service was new to Scottsdale Public Library, so we wanted all patrons to receive consistent information, and the in-person registration also gave us an opportunity to answer patron questions and address any concerns that patrons might have. So in using Polaris, as Mandy said, we worked closely with our tech team to set up the procedures. We used an available field that was um, not being used in Polaris with a yes, no input. By using this, we created an easy and quick way for staff to easily identify patrons who were registered Pony Express users. We added the photo, the picture component to Pony Express accounts. By adding the photo, it gave us, gave us an additional way to identify patrons as registered Pony Express users. But more importantly, we had a way to identify patrons if there were any issues when they were inside the building. We reset the expiration dates at the time of registration to sync up library card account renewals with the Pony Express renewals. We decided to reset all registration to be uh, expiration dates to be in line with their Pony Express registration date. Since we already require an annual library card renewal, we wanted to reduce the number of times that patrons were asked to renew their library cards. This also gave us a very easy way to track registration numbers. We created an, uh, we checked non-blocking notes field for any Pony Express rev uh, revocations or library building trespasses. At the time of the registration, staff was checking the patron records to see if this patron had had any issues with behavioral uh, problems uh, and had possibly been trespassed in the past. And we also had patrons reset their pins to a four digit number at the time of registration. Since the software required patrons to have a four digit numeric pin, we decided to verify that the patrons knew their pin and ended up resetting many as they didn't remember what it was or they had previously used an alpha pin for their account. Again, we were trying to reduce the issues that patrons might have 
as they begin to use this service. So here are the specific components of our user agreement. I must only grant entry to myself and any minor I am responsible for while using this service. Any other adult must have a signed user agreement on file and must gain entry using his or her own card. Basically, we were saying one scan, one entry. This was really one of the most important points that staff had to explain. For we needed to have a clear, clear data on who was in the building. We highlighted that each adult must register and scan their card individually to gain entry to the building. I and any minors I bring in with me will be on camera while using this service. We were required to inform patrons that there was camera surveillance and also posted signage at the front door with this information. This service is self-directed and in-person library staff assistance will not be available to me. We needed patrons to fully understand the self-service aspect and this helped them understand this variation from our typical staffed library services. In the beginning of this service, we did have a few patrons knock on our staff entrance door. So then we posted signage at the door that said, here's the helpline number that you can use to call for assistance. During the registration process, there were a few times that we suggested a patron visit another building as it was clear that this self-service model was not going to work with them. And we found that most of these patrons were people who needed assistance with using the computers and or printing options. Emergencies may occur and an emergency line to dial 911 is, for help is available to me at all times. We installed an, uh, a specific phone that was the labeled the emergency phone. It was locked and only able to call 911. The location of the phone was clearly labeled with signage and placement on our building directory. We also highlighted and showed the patrons where this was at the time of their registration. I must adhere to all library conduct rules and a copy was provided at the time of signature and posted on site. We reminded patrons that the rules of conduct still applied even if staff was not present. Each welcome packet that the patrons received at the time of registration also included a copy of the library's rule of conduct. I must call 480312-READ if I see anyone violating this agreement or if I see anything suspicious while at the Pony Express site. By enlisting all patrons to be involved with the one adult, one scan component of the service, we asked them not to get involved or confront the patron who was violating the agreement, but rather asked them to contact, contact us to follow up. This sentence is highlighted in the pre presentation because the helpline will not be available with any future use of Pony Express's service as the helpline hours are not consistent with the hours we hope to use Pony Express for. So this sentence would then be removed from any future agreements. No animals are permitted in the library except for service animals as defined by ARS number 11.1024. By listing that only service animals were allowed in the building, we were again highlighting that the same rules applied, even if staff were not present to enforce. And lastly, if I fail to comply with any terms of this agreement, my privileges may be revoked, and including a process, it included a process to challenge the revocation. We tried to portray that this service was a trial and using it was a privilege. If patrons broke the rules or if there were a lot of issues, the service could actually even be canceled. We wanted to foster patron ownership of this service. So the process to converting to self-service. This process truly required us to put ourselves in the patron's shoes and evaluate how they would be successful in finding or doing what they came to the library for. We were walked the building to consider all places where staff have a traditionally assisted patrons. We walked the service floor both with the operations team and our graphic designer 
to identify points or areas that would need to be addressed with additional signage. We looked at all areas of the library, but especially the service desks where staff were typically available to assist patrons. We examined the collection for layman's terms, terms versus how it was listed in our catalog. So we evaluated the signage that was needed. And as we did so, we were careful to match the language that we used in our catalog with what we put on signage. For instance, J-Easy books were also listed as J-Picture books, as that's what patrons typically came in looking for. We created signage to delineate spaces, guide patrons in their actions in the building, and orient them to the resources. So we added signage to tell patrons where the restrooms are, where the designated eating areas were, and where the various materials could be found. And lastly, we hosted a navigational audit, both before the signage refresh, refresh to pinpoint problem areas and afterwards to review effectiveness of the sign revision. Using the navigational audit provided valuable information on how patrons would use the library. We were very intentional on who was invited as we wanted both new and experienced users to give us feedback. The extra eyes and experience really helped us to design the most effective signs, both in what they said and also where they were placed. So here's a couple of graphics to share with you. Um, this is um, on the left, our shelf locator guide. Um, we have a fabulous graphic designer on staff and she worked very closely with us to create the document that was going to help our patrons be successful. The, um, each welcome packet included a copy of this. And we also po posted a large poster sign version at the entrance of the library to be a quick guide for patrons. On the back side is the document you see on the right. And it was a how-to guide. It was created and we placed these at all of the computers that were library catalog computers. We wanted, again, to help teach patrons how to use a library and to successfully find materials. Many of our patrons aren't familiar with how libraries organize materials and label the collections. And this guide gave a great overview of how they could be successful. Uh, we posted this document, as I said, next to the four library catalog computers, and we also had some right underneath the big um, poster size of the shelf locator guide. This um, is a, a picture of our instructions that are posted at the print copy stand, scan station. Our experience showed us that many patrons had issues with using technology and we were concerned that this would be one area where the helpline staff might not be able to assist them. Our graphic designer created this large and very clear sign that as you can see, or I'll tell you is right above our print station. So the patrons are able to see what they're doing as they're doing it. It gave them a step-by-step -step process of using the services and I'm really pleased to say that we refused, we received very few questions about these during the times that we were using Pony Express. And, and then here is an example of what I shared earlier about how the signage on the end caps was modified to include both what was in the catalog, but also what the patrons were looking for. All the end cap signage was updated to include color coding as well as the shelf number and a listing of what was on that range. So strategic placement. In order to help avoid sign fatigue, we placed signs where we felt they would be most potent. In creating and placing signs, we worked to provide what was most helpful to our patron patrons without over signing the building. By using color in the shelf locator guide, we gave patrons one more way to find materials. And then this is an example of signage that we had placed right at our front entrance. This is the front door of Appaloosa. And we found that um, over the course of time, these signs were modified several times because we found patrons didn't really understand how 
Pony Express worked. And if they approached an open door, they would just walk right in. So we became bolder as we went through the modifications and what we posted as we worked to better explain how the service worked and where they could get assistance. The Pony Express was open, all the hours that Pony Express was open, our window was always open. So they had on-site assistance, but they could also call the helpline. Uh, while it's not shown in this picture, we also had clear instructions posted on our keypad that told patrons how to scan in, but also how they could get assistance. Um, and I already told you that we use the helpline and the drive up window. And I, I have to say, as we got smarter with the signage, we did find that fewer people were coming to the window or calling the helpline. And then the last guide that we placed out on the floor was uh, how to place, how to order hold cards at the bottom of all the library card uh, catalog computers. This is just another example of in place signage that we created where the patrons would hopefully need it the most and be able to get their question answered without becoming frustrated. We again wanted to reduce the questions and possible frustra frustrations for our patrons. And now Becky is going to continue on. Thanks Guy. I'm going to switch gears and talk about how we marketed this new service and I know that uh, we're a little pressed for time so I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, our marketing efforts began to the public and registration began the week prior to opening Pony Express. The evening before we started taking registrations, we sent out a special library e e newsletter advertising this new service. This, new, this newsletter described the service, explained when registration began, and linked to a web page dedicated to Pony Express. The Pony Express webpage includes a three minute video from our director explaining the service, registration process, and other general information. In addition to the overview video, the webpage includes FAQs and links to additional information for registered users, including a video on how to scan their library card to gain entrance into the building and other information specific to using the building without staff assistance. When we started registering patrons, staff told each patron who came through the drive up window at Appaloosa about the new service and asked if they wanted to register. While this was very time consuming, this marketing method was very effective and many patrons heard about the service via this approach. In addition to these efforts, quarter page flyers were made by our graphics team and handed out to patrons at the drive through window at the Appaloosa Library as well as to pat patrons who utilize the Arabian library drive through window. Flyers were distributed to the patrons at Arabian because it's our branch that's closest to Appaloosa and like Appaloosa, the Arabian library building was also closed due to the pandemic. Information about the Point Express service was also added to the library helpline pre-recording, which is heard by all patrons who call the library for assistance. And finally, our library director was interviewed on AZPBS, and there was an article about the Pony Express in the Scottsdale Progress newspaper several months after we opened. Prior to implementing the Pony Express service, we decided to evaluate how things were going at the three month mark. We wanted to gauge the success and effectiveness of the Pony Express service soon after imp implementation so we could make any needed adjustments early. Since we do not interact with Pony Express patrons after registration, we solicited their, their feedback by sending all Pony Express registered patrons a survey via email. We intentionally kept the survey very short, only five questions, in hopes that a brief survey would get a higher response. We requested that all registered patrons complete the survey, even if they had not yet used the service. Of the 1,312 users the survey was sent to, 363 patrons responded, which is close to a 30% response rate. Of those who responded, 63% had used the service more than once. And as you can see from the pie chart, the occasional users were the group that responded to the survey the most. Next, 20% of the responses came from patrons who had only used the service once, and 14% of the responses came from those who had not used the service. So as you can see, we got a good mix of responses from patrons who had used the service regularly to those who had used it only once or none. The feedback we received was overwhelmingly positive. 
We asked the survey respondents to rate their overall satisfaction with the Express service using a scale of one to five stars. The average rating was 4.3. While the overall rating of the service was very good, not everyone was happy with the service. I'm gonna first share the feedback from those who were the least satisfied. 5.7% of the respondents gave the service a one or two star score. For survey respondents who gave us a one or two star rating, we asked them to share the reason for their low score. The most common reason for the low rating was inconvenient and or insufficient open hours. As you may recall from when Mandy spoke, we were open 24 hours a week, four hours a day, Monday through Saturday. Patrons did not understand why we needed to limit the open hours given the service did not require any staffing and was completely self-serve. Most of the patrons who scored the service low used the service only one time or not at all. Had they used the service several times and got comfortable with it, their score may have been higher. And also, had we sent the survey out after more time had passed after implementation, we may have had fewer low ratings. However, some of the servant respondents were more frequent users and in fact successful at completing the desired task, but still rated the service low due to the insufficient or inconvenient hours. We also got some other comments from patrons who gave us low scores not related to the hours such as it's too much trouble to use the library now, so I don't. And another comment was, there are a lot of us who are older who really appreciate the help you used to give us. This way is not helpful. Finally, we got some comments of frustration related to the city's pandemic response, such as complaints related to people not wearing masks and comments about why the library is not fully open with staff when other non scotsdale libraries and businesses were open. So although clearly the available hours was the main reason for the low scores, some of the low scores were specifically COVID related and beyond the library staff's control. Now on for the positive news, uh, one of the most important questions we asked in the survey was if the patron was able to find the library materials they were looking for and or accomplish what they had wanted to do when they came to the library. As you can see from these results, over 80% of the survey respondents stated they were completely successful or mostly successful in accomplishing what they had wanted to do when visiting the library using Pony Express. We did have 15 respondents state that they were not successful in using the Pony Express service. We attribute the overall success of this service to the fact that many of these patrons used the Appaloosa Library when it was fully staffed and the improved signage, self-locator guide, directory, and other resources we made available to assist patrons when using the library without staff assistance. We are very pleased to see that most of the Pony Express patrons were able to adapt quickly to using the new service and were successful in using the service self-service model. The last survey question was an open-ended question to give patrons an opportunity to share specific feedback and that was not covered elsewhere in the survey. We considered making the question a multiple choice answer, but decided against doing so, so that we would not sway the answers with any of our preconceived ideas. That turned out to be a good decision because we thought patrons would mainly respond with the services we were no longer offering in the building, but instead we got a different type of response. These four responses listed in order were the most common responses we received. The responses for this question confirmed many of our own expectations for the service, mainly that the service would not meet the needs of all patrons, and that many patrons want and need staff assistance. And finally, while grateful for being able to use the library after it had been closed for one year due to the pandemic, patrons still really wanted a fully open, fully staffed library. Finally, we wanted to share a few other quotes that we received from the patron survey. I'm gonna pause for just a second so you can read them over. To summarize the survey results, while we did receive expected feedback, we also gathered some useful data, data. In particular, that the vast majority of patrons were successful with using the service and they were very grateful to have the ability to use the library in a limited capacity given we were in the middle of a pandemic. From an improvement perspective, we heard that patrons wanted and expected longer, more convenient hours. 
From our perspective, the Pony Express service was an excellent temporary solution to allow us to open the Appaloosa Library with reduced services when we did not have the resources to open the library in any other way. I'm gonna to try to make this slide a little bit brief, but um, this is our usage statistics for the first eight and a half months. New registrations were not surprisingly the highest the first month we opened. However, from April to December, we were very consistent in registering nearly 300 new patrons monthly. We now have over 2,700 patrons registered. Gate count has hovered near 1,000 patrons monthly for the 24 hours a week access that we provided. Uh, we did see a drop in use from August through October, and then gate count trended back up for the final two months of the year. We expected gate count to steadily increase over time, given we were registering 300 new patrons each month, but as you can see from the graph, that did not materialize in the first nine months. Our annual System-wide circulation trend peaks in the summer month, which as you can see in the graph was consistent with what occurred with the Pony Express service. And for those who are wondering how circulation compared at Appaloosa with just the drive-through window versus the drive-through window and the Pony Express service, circulation was up 41% from April through December in 2021 compared to 2020. Okay, moving on to key takeaways. Um, first, the service to, does not supplant a full service library with staff. Regardless of whether a patron had been successful with using Pony Express or not, we had heard across the board that everyone would prefer a full service, fully staffed open library versus a self service and reduced service model. Two, the second, the service was a specific, has a specific target audience of patrons that feel comfortable with technology and navigating resources independently independently. We knew going into this that the service would not be a good for, fit for everyone, and our initial data along with the survey responses confirmed this. Given this library is located in an area heavily populated with senior citizens who may be less technology savvy than other age groups, the audience that would use a self-service library in this particular area of the city was likely smaller than what we would expect from the population surrounding our other branches. Third, sliding glass doors are not ideal for this kind of service. The safety features needed for their operation increased intentional and accidental piggybacking. Like most urban libraries, the Appaloosa Library has sliding glass doors that have a sensor that will open the door, keep a door open when a person is near the inside of the door. This feature causes the doors to be open frequently, allowing patrons registered or not to easily gain entry without swiping their library card. Next, we have had issues with piggyback, piggybacking patrons. Even so, loss of materials or items, vandalism or safety issues in the library has been next to zero. This, the issue of patrons entering the library without scanning their card was definitely one of our greatest challenges. Nonetheless, we've had zero vandalism, zero safety, and zero safety issues in the library. We also have had, not had any issues with materials being stolen. Because we use RFID, we know that when an item leaves the building that has not been checked out, and on the rare occasion that this has occurred, all of these items were returned. Next and final, signage and guides we use in the self-service model proved to be highly effective and are being implemented at full-service branches. The changes we made to the interior signage have been very helpful to patrons. In addition to getting positive feedback from the Pony Express patrons about our new signage and guides, Staff at our other branches have been very envious of what was created for Pony Express. We'll be modifying our signs in our other branches to be similar to what we designed for the Pony Express service. Okay, quickly wrapping up um, so we can get to questions. In terms of our future use, um, as Mandy mentioned, we reopened the Appaloosa Library in January with our hours that are similar to our pre-COVID hours. And at that time, we made the decision to pause the Pony Express service. When we opened, or excuse me, when we purchased Open Plus from Bibliotheca last year, we signed a three-year maintenance agreement. So we have two years left on our contract, and we've been exploring a couple different options on how to use those remaining two years. The first option is to leave the Pony Express service at Appaloosa and expand the library hours to allow patrons to come into the building before regular opening hours. 
This would be particularly beneficial on Sunday mornings when we do not open until one o'clock. Second, we consider moving the service to an offsite non-library building location to provide services in areas of the city where we perceive there to be a need. We consider two different locations and I'm gonna kind of skip over what those were, but um, we did evaluate two different offsite locations. After evaluating the cost and expected benefit to our patrons for these three different locations, we decided to keep Pony Express at Appaloosa. We're in the process of making some minor building modifications related to the interior building lights uh, to begin utilizing the service for these earlier pre-opening hours. So we just wanted to mention real quick that um, when we receive our presentation in a couple of days, there'll be attachments with these additional resources. Many of them are the things that Sky went over. So we thought that might be helpful for you as well as links to our Point Express webpage and some of our press pieces. And then finally, we're gonna uh, jump on into questions. These are our email addresses. Feel free if you have questions after today's uh, presentation and after the Q&A section, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to help you. And Patty, I'll turn it over to you so you can uh, tell us what questions there are. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that there is still time to submit your questions using the fat of uh, sorry the chat feature at the bottom of your screen uh, we will answer as many questions as possible during the q a so we'll start with a couple that came in during the uh during the presentation uh first of all was there any impact on employee morale due to this type of service like what did librarians and library workers at your other branches think of it those kind of ramifications. This is Mandy, and I will say um, when this service was first communicated out to the staff, the reaction you would anticipate in terms of, is this replacing my job? Um, nervousness that everything's becoming automated was there. That is, um, we, we let the staff know that's not the case. We were very intentional, like we said in the messaging, that this is abbreviated service and it is in no way supposed to supplant a full library service. There were too many things that, that this service could not provide that only our staff could provide. So yes, there was some trepidation, um, definitely had to get that message in across internally to stakeholders and externally so that people didn't come to the library expecting what they always expected. And I think once the service launched and people could see what it really was, it did help with morale and those concerns did fade away. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I would see where people would be skeptical about that uh, moving into something new like this. Uh, a couple questions about the logistics. And I know you answered a lot of questions about these, um, or you answered, you presented a lot of information about these issues, but maybe a little more uh, granular. Um, do you have, now that you've done this, do you have any ideas of um, how you would encourage piggybacking moving forward? How we would discourage piggybacking? Sorry, discourage, discourage, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think part of it, like we said, those sliding glass doors, when we started, we didn't realize what a hindrance it would be. The other systems we talked to and the informational videos always had the pull open doors, which as you know, you pull open, you step through, it closes behind you. Sliding glass doors have that safety feature where they just stay open in order not to crush someone in the doors that you can't override. Um, so one way to discourage it, if anyone else is wanting to do this, is if you have um, a door that's a pull open door, it's going to work better than the, than the glass sliding doors. Um, the other way that we actually did discourage because as we ran this over the eight months, we're like, why are they still piggybacking? What can we do? And you could see with the signage placement portion, that sign that said, stop, check in, you know, you must be registered, kept moving closer and closer and closer to the door until it was almost like, you must climb over the sign in order to get into the <laughs> building. Um, because many of them, people just didn't realize. They're like, oh, the building's open because I saw an open glass door and walk on in. Most people, as I think that we all know as a public library um, 
in, in the public library profession, most people actually want to use us correctly. Um, most of the times you can make a rule that will be followed by 99% of the population and they'll be the 1% that, that decide I'm going to break this rule. And we never ever make rules or stop services based on those 1%. So we just anticipated that most people wanted to do this correctly. Um, and we found that they, did, that they did. There were definitely some people who would just walk on in, but at least those are the ones that still use the library as they were supposed to, even though they couldn't be bothered to register. And so based on that, um, we decided that the service was successful because it still served the, the greater. We didn't have that, we didn't have more people walking in without um, not logging in than, than, than walking in. So hopefully that helps with, with anyone who wants to start this up and wants to make sure they know who's in their library. Yeah, so just maybe different doors and definitely lots of great signage. Yeah, I think signage is definitely key because like I said, people want to follow the rules. So we just had to make it very clear on what those rules were and how to get into the library, I'll say legally, library legally, <laughs> and they would do that. <laughs> Kind of along those same lines, you mentioned in the presentation that you really didn't, you, number one, you didn't have any vandalism and had very little theft. Um, what do you attribute that to? The same idea or was there something else that you did that um, cut theft down and made sure that items didn't just walk away? I would say a combination. Um, one thing that, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of people coming in with no staff. I mean, everybody, I think with all the emails that we get from other library systems about this, that always comes up. And there was one library system that we spoke to um, that actually kind of nailed it on the head. And she said that staff are not security. They're merely a deterrent to um, theft and vandalism and anything else that goes wrong. When you do this service, the cameras become the new deterrent. So if someone were to steal a book, the staff aren't going to tackle them. Um, and actually that makes the cameras more valuable. We can actually see who scanned in. We can see their face. We can see what book they took, uh, what book that, um, what book left, RFID red lines, what left. We can actually figure out exactly what left, whereas staff would have a harder time doing that. Um, but I also think it was a combination of what we said that most library users want to use it correctly. Um, and you know, having those other measures in place, I think, I think really helped because even when they didn't use it correctly, they still used their things correctly. They brought the, they brought items back and they didn't take anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I see that in the school library all the time too. I get books that never got checked out. Um, yeah. It's a community so resource. It's a community <laughs> resource and everybody, you know, they understand that this is, this is there for them. So I think most people recognize that and respect it. Excellent. Plus, I, I do have to say too, I do have to say, we chose a location where we knew that um, we didn't have as many incidents with library use. So mm -hmm. we did set ourselves up for the best possible outcome. Did you, I, I, thinking about all the signage that you created and you mentioned that other branches want that signage now, uh, have you seen any changes in patron behavior since maybe they're use of Pony Express? Like, are they more independent users? Um, you know, maybe. <laughs> uh, let me try to get questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen as you finish answering. I would say maybe, um, because those independent users don't tell us they're independent. We just, we never even see them. They just mm. use. So, which is great. We want people to have a choice to either interact with us to get what they need or do it on their own. And those independent users, we may, we may not notice that they've used us at all. Um, so it, it, that one's a hard one to answer. Okay, well, we are um, just about out of time. I wanna thank, um, thank you all for being with us today. Presenters, thank you so much for sharing this really, I think, kind of exciting um, tool to help patrons and to expand what we're able to provide uh, to our communities. Um, thanks for doing all the, the hard work and sharing that with us. Um, participants, you will receive an email with a link to this recording. 
uh, of the webinar and um, also all of the, the presentation and the um, attachments from our presenters today. Uh, I just want to wish you all a wonderful day. Have a great afternoon.